There are many ways to break down a castle's defences. Brute force, fire, starvation, even cunning. But sometimes cunning can be the defender's best friend too. In its heyday, a castle like this one at Pembroke in South Wales served more than one purpose. Could be a holiday home for the lord who owned it, could also be a garrison for his troops, or prison, a court, even a bank. But most of all, it was a shelter, a safe haven from the tumult of war, a place from which troops could sally forth to attack the enemy. In the words of one medieval monk, the purpose of castles was to enable these men, constantly occupied with quarrels and massacres, to protect themselves from their enemies, to triumph over their equals, and to oppress their inferiors. It's no wonder, then, that castles frequently came under siege, as attacking forces tried to strangle the life of the garrison inside. Sometimes a siege could be over within weeks. More often it was months, and sometimes even years. This fine castle shows how castle design was adapted to afford maximum protection at minimum cost, and in its early days it must have cost very little. The site is a naturally defensive position and allows easy access to the river and to the sea. Back in the 1100s, when Pembroke was first built, people were slow to catch on to the idea of using stone for anything other than churches. The original castle was rather less impressive than what we see here today. Just turf and wooden stakes, it was commanded by Gerald of Windsor, a man his grandson described as being stalwart and cunning. Back in those early days, this Norman outpost intruded into the territory of the Welsh. Naturally, they weren't best pleased to lose their land and livelihoods to the arrogant incomers, these jumped-up Normans, and so they laid siege to the castle. And so terrifying were the Welsh attackers to the Normans within, that no fewer than fifteen knights deserted the compound and clambered into a boat to make their getaway. This was the kind of moment that could make or break a military commander. Sooner than admit defeat, Gerald instantly promoted the deserters' servants as knights and promised them all of their former master's lands. With such performance-related bonuses on offer, if they could live to collect them, it was small wonder that the men settled down to endure a long, hard siege. As so often before and since, the biggest threat to their survival was starvation, and their biggest asset was Gerald's cunning. As the siege went on, Pembroke was reduced to its last four hogs. These the garrison eyed longingly, savouring the thought of delicious pork and crackling. When these were gone, there would be nothing else to eat. The Welsh outside the castle must have sensed they were close to victory. Gerald gave orders for the hogs to be slaughtered and roasted on the spit. Stomachs rumbled. The hungry garrison salivated at the thought of fresh meat. Everybody got ready to carve a slice to satisfy the craving. But when they heard the next order, they must have found it harder than ever to maintain discipline. But Gerald ordered the hogs to be cut into pieces and hurled over the palisades at the besiegers. The Welsh besiegers were thoroughly taken in by this ruse. If they can afford to waste meat like this, they said, who knows how long the siege can go on? <laughs> 
Their fears were confirmed the next day when they stumbled across a letter that had been planted by one of Gerald's messengers outside the local bishop's lodging. The letter was supposedly written to Gerald's overlord, Arnold. This ingenious piece of counterintelligence said in effect, don't bother to send reinforcements, we could hold out for months if necessary. And when the Welsh read that, they lost all interest in continuing the siege and went quietly home. Whilst cool and cunning could often win the day in a siege, the Norman lords of Pembroke soon realised they'd need more substantial defences than wooden stakes and turf. What we see here is a mighty stone keep, a more correctly known as a donjon, and yes, it's made of stone and not wood, but it served exactly the same purpose, only it was stronger and fireproof, the perfect place to retreat to during a siege. This imposing keep and much of the rest of the stone castle that we see today were built on the orders of William Marshall, one of the most powerful men in medieval history. During his 30-year reign, William Marshall made Pembroke into the mighty stronghold that we see here today. Marshall's hold over this part of Wales was complete. The only time his castle came under threat from the Welsh, he managed to buy off the attackers for no more than a hundred pounds. But his downfall was to come across the seas, in Ireland. He might have made this castle impregnable by physical enemies, but how about the spiritual? William Marshall had five sons and five daughters. It so happened that over in Ireland, he fell into a dispute with Albinus O. Malmweed, the Bishop of Ferns, over some land. The wrangling went on and on, until finally the Bishop lost patience and uttered a curse against William Marshall's family. With that, the story goes, the fate of the male members was sealed. One was murdered. One killed whilst out riding. All of them died relatively young and all of them without heirs. As to the daughters, they all married and the entire Marshall estate was broken up. To offend a bishop was a foolish move. However thick its walls, a castle like Pembroke was just as likely to change hands through marriage as it was through siege engines and battering rams. And Pembroke did change hands many times over the centuries, but never once was it captured by the local Welsh, unlike our next castle. Harlech stands on a rocky cliff a little way inland from the sea. But at the time it was built, the sea once lapped around these cliffs and boats could unload their wares at the foot of the castle walls. Harlech is perhaps one of the most striking castle designs in the whole of Britain. It was erected at the command of Edward Longshanks, King Edward I, after he had finally overcome the Welsh and subdued them under English rule. Edward spared no expense in erecting a curtain of stone and steel with which to keep the rebellious Welsh under control. The top architect of the day, Master James of St. George, was called in from distant Savoy to offer his adventurous ideas, which he was happy to execute. Once it was completed, the castle came under the command of its architect, and the job was clearly no sinecure. Master James must have been grateful for every single stone of its concentric walls, for the Welsh were at this time to show no more hospitality to the garrison at Harlech than they showed previously to the hapless denizens of Pembroke. Perhaps for the Welsh, the construction at Harlech was a greater provocation than anywhere else. For this mighty cliff overlooking the sea was steeped in ancient legend. For those Welsh men and women who knew their mythology, building on the rock of Arlech was almost as sacrilegious 
as opening a burger bar at Wounded Knee, or putting up a high-rise building at Gettysburg. Harlech was where in legend the Welsh king Bendigaid Vran had spied ships crossing over from Ireland. They carried the king of Ireland, Matholuk, who was to wed the heroine Branwen. Her very name has passed into the fabric of the castle, for one tower is to this day known as Tour Branwen, or Branwen's Tower. Nor was this the only legend to be forged at Harlech. It took nearly a thousand artisans to build this castle, both men and materials arriving by sea. As the walls rose ever higher, so the desire to pull them down, or at least scale them, grew ever deeper in the hearts of the Welsh. Just a few years after it was finished, a violent rebellion left the castle garrison weak and vulnerable. Fortunately for them, the castle could not be completely surrounded by the Welsh. Because of the passageway to the sea, supplies could be brought in by ship. And this indeed happened. Much to the relief of the garrison, four ships arrived from Ireland with very welcome supplies of corn, salted fish, coal and cloth and a further consignment arrived from nearby Bulmaris of oats and wheat. The castle proved lucky on that occasion, but its luck was not to hold out forever. The most dramatic events in Harlech's history occurred during the rebellion of Owain Glyndwr, and this castle was a prize that Owain desperately wished to call his own. Owain is one of the most remarkable figures of the Middle Ages. A descendant of the Welsh princes, he managed to live a very comfortable existence in his two courts, and evidently was highly regarded in London for his skill on legal matters. At least, he trained as a lawyer, although it's possible he spent more time brawling with lance and sword than dealing with legal subtleties in the courts of law. By the year 1400, animosity between Welsh and English had grown to such a head that the country was ripe for rebellion. Amongst his own people, Owain was regarded as the rightful Prince of Wales, and he did little to disabuse them of the notion. His campaign to recapture Wales for the Welsh got off to a fine start. Castle after castle fell to his onslaught. Harlech proved a tougher proposition than many, but fired by patriotic zeal, Owain was determined to make it his own. The siege commenced in 1403. Once again, the familiar tactic was used of trying to starve the garrison out of existence. This time, though, the garrison was to enjoy no relief by sea. The walls were strong. The gatehouse was practically impregnable, with its mighty oak door, its portcullis, its loopholes where crossbowmen would unleash a deadly hail of arrows, its narrow corridor leading to yet more heavy doors and portcullises. But castles can be prisons as well as safe havens. In the early stages, most fatalities among the English defenders were from missiles aimed at them from outside or from subsequent medical treatment. The amputation knife. This has taken off the limbs. You have the coarse eyes and irons. Uh, obviously, it's, it's, it's all about time. You must get to the patient and before the poison spreads. And of course, poison was a big factor for a lot of these arrow uh, heads were actually um, barbed with excrement and feces and all sorts. So septicemia, blood poisoning, was a big factor within medieval warfare, siege warfare, siege warfare especially. By January 1404, there were a mere five men left. Water, which is essential for life, was reduced to a meager ration to serve for drinking, washing and cooking. At a time when medical knowledge was minimal, 
disease could soon stalk the bedchambers and the corridors. In many sieges, disease was intentionally spread by besieging armies. In this primitive age of germ warfare, they might hurl disgusting leprous carcasses, even plague-ridden corpses over the castle walls to infect the garrison. In Harlech, as in any besieged castle, diagnosis was primitive and treatment radical. By sampling the urine, they would be able to say, ah yes, one of the, um, one of the humours is wrong, and I do believe you, the patient is suffering from uh, poisonous fumes known as miasma. And they would t label it as ague, but ague basically was malaria. And <laughs> the only thing they actually done for this was to actually bleed the patient. So they would cut a vein, say in the arm, um, bleed the patient until the patient was actually close to death, I must confess. And then they'd obviously um, um, wrap the arm up and uh, no doubt you'd be feeling better for it the next day or so. But it really is that crude. Finally, the men attempted to break out from the castle, but failed. Owen Glendua demanded their surrender, and they gave in. For five years, Owen Glendua held court here, as he masterminded the campaign for Welsh independence. Some have credited him with inventing the apparatus of the modern nation-state. Certainly, he seems to have believed in a sense of nationalism at a time when such a concept had hardly dawned on most people. But if starvation or brute force were the usual keys to a besieged castle's door, there were other ways in. Unlike Pembroke and Harlech, which stand on naturally defensive positions, Caerphilly in South Wales seems one of the worst places on earth to build a castle. The ground is low, and it's surrounded by hills on all sides. And yet, because of the ingenuity of its designers, any attacker approaching the castle would have to endure pitiless fire from well-protected defenders. And this castle proved impervious to most forms of assault. It looks peaceful enough today, but back in the 1270s, this was slap bang in the middle of the frontier between England and Wales. Then it was a tense and uneasy place. Raids, skirmishes and murders on both sides of the border were so common as hardly to merit a special mention. Even so, for an English baron to build such a massive castle right next to his Welsh neighbour was provocation on a grand scale. That baron was Earl Gilbert de Clare, also known as Gilbert the Red because of his flaming locks. Red hair was believed to signify a violent temper, and Gilbert certainly lived up to expectations. His neighbour, Llewellyn, had risen to the status of Prince of Wales, and Gilbert's castle represented an obvious threat to his authority. Building this grand castle here was rather like lighting a fuse. Just stand back and wait for the fireworks. Almost as soon as the first foundations were laid, the Welsh attacked. One October night in 1270, they tried unsuccessfully to burn the castle, but Gilbert remained undeterred. He was just 25 years old but he'd already taken part in one of the most epic sieges in English history at Kenilworth, where the garrison had held out for almost nine months. Kenilworth's main defence was a huge lake which surrounded the castle, and the effectiveness of that wide stretch of water hadn't been lost on Gilbert. He encircled Caerphilly with these vast moats. They ensured that tunnelling underneath the walls was impossible, as was raising belfries or towers to scale the walls. The only remaining option for an attacking army was artillery to batter the walls down or to wait until starvation and sickness drove out the garrison. Both could take a very long time. By 1272, the standoff between Llewellyn and Gilbert had become serious enough for the King of England, Henry III, to step in.
Henry had just made peace with Llewellyn, and the last thing he needed was an upstart, short-tempered baron provoking him into making war. The only way of diffusing the tension was to put the castle into neutral hands. For that reason, King Henry ordered it to be put in the charge of two bishops who acted as peacekeepers. For a time at least, Gilbert agreed to withdraw. A small detachment of men was sent by the bishops, and they duly took over the building. Having carefully designed a castle to withstand the latest in siege warfare, Gilbert de Clare now faced the problem of how to get it back. He could hardly launch a conventional attack. It was designed to hold out for years. With all those towers and battlements stacked up in lairs, archers in the castle could mow his men down as easily as threshing corn in a meadow. Something else was needed. Sheer, unadulterated cunning. Gilbert had another castle in his command, some miles away in the then small town of Cardiff. He sent the constable of Cardiff and two knights to Caerphilly to pretend to check the inventory of stores and arms held in the castle. It was a reasonable request. They just needed to know where things were and how many. It was just a mere formality, really. Shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Now, normally, Sentries were under strict orders not to let anybody in without proof of identity. After all, the entrance was the strongest point of the castle. It was protected by gates, portcullises, arrow slits and murder holes through which red-hot iron bars could be poured. Any stranger entering had better have a good story. Gilbert's men did. They seemed so plausible. They were so affable. What else could the sentry do except open the doors to these jovial men from down the road? But they were soon to regret their misjudgment, and no sooner had they opened up the castle than the two knights held the gate ajar as forty men-at-arms charged in and easily overcame the bishop's men. The cunning red-haired Gilbert had got his castle back, and this time he was in no mood to give it up again, either for king or country. Caerphilly stood as a magnificent symbol of his success, but within a hundred years it was to begin to fall gradually into decay, its lakes silting up, its walls robbed of their stones for other buildings. Yet even after seven hundred years, its imposing grandeur remains an eloquent witness to a time when high walls and battlements represented authority, status, and safety.